Remember and give thanks. Gratitude is the key to keeping covenant with God. It is the fountainhead out from which all other righteousness flows. As our text in Micah 6 asks us this morning, what does God want from you? As we'll see, the answer is, it all starts with gratitude as we remember and give thanks. This morning in Micah 6, the first eight verses, we're going to see three sections of this text. First, we'll see God's indictment against his own people in verses 1 through 3. Then we will see in verses 4 and 5 what God has done for his people. And finally, in verses 6 through 8, we will see what God expects from his people. So first of all, God's indictment against his people. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. This word for plead or indict or contend is the same Hebrew word used three different times in these verses. It's the word reeb, and it literally refers to grappling, but it's usually used in a figurative sense of contending with someone in a controversy, to strive, to plead. Here, God is striving and pleading against his own people. How did they get to that point? All through the Old Testament, they've heard the Psalms that use this word, reeb, over and over again to describe how God pleads, he strives, he contends against the enemies of his people to deliver his people. God is a God who reebs with his enemies to deliver his own people. And now Micah's saying, hear, O Israel, the Lord is going to reeb with you because he's got a problem. What's the problem? God calls the mountains, by the way, to witness, the hills of the earth to witness his indictment, his pleading and striving against his own people. That's interesting. To our modern ears, that sounds weird, maybe a little bit poetic, but that's about it. Well, when we remember the context of God's people in the Old Testament, mountains have always been witnesses, direct, immediate, front row witnesses to God's covenant acts on behalf of his own people. It started all the way in the Garden of Eden, which was on a mountain, where God established his covenant with Adam. God reestablished his covenant with Noah on the mountains of Ararat after the flood, where Noah offered sacrifices to God and was recommissioned. God, when he brought his people out of Egypt, where did he bring them to? to Mount Sinai, then he reestablished his covenant with them. What happens when David and Solomon come? God establishes the throne of the Messianic king on Mount Zion, and then right next to it on Mount Moriah, he establishes the new temple in which he has promised to dwell. The same Mount Moriah where God established his covenant with Abraham when he told Abraham to bring Isaac for an offering. Later, Elijah contends with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel as God once again reestablishes himself as the covenant Lord of Israel. And of course, we know that Jesus died for our sins on Mount Calvary. None of this is by accident. The mountains all along through Israel's history have been the direct witnesses to God's covenant acts on behalf of his people. So when God now has a case to bring against his people for breaking that covenant, He's going to call the mountains to witness because they've seen all the goodness of God and now the mountains are going to witness against God's people. Uh, Incidentally, men do this throughout the Old Testament too. They use witnesses when they make covenants with one another, but men aren't big enough to use mountains. But we are the image of God, so instead we use rocks, right? Joshua brings a pile of rocks out of the river as a memorial to God's covenant deliverance of his people. Jacob and Laban make a mountain of rocks in the mountain when they make a covenant. Uh, Samuel sets up the rock, Ebenezer, as a witness to God's covenant deliverance. So God uses mountains, men use rocks. Um, Verse three, what's the problem here? Why is there something so serious to make God the contender for his people to be God the contender against his people and to call these mountains to witness how his people have broken covenant with him? Well, verse three, God says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? God's people are wearied with him and he knows it. This word for wearied is the Hebrew word law'ah. It can have two different senses. I think both of which are probably implied here. One is just to make tired and weary. The sense of 
re uh, fatigue through repetition. I don't care anymore. I've moved on from this. The other is a sense of actually being disgusted with something. This is the same Hebrew word that God used to describe the reaction of the Egyptians whenever he killed all the fish in their river and made their drinking water smell like dead, putrefying fish, and they were la'aw. They were disgusted. So are God's people disgusted with him, or are they just bored with him? Perhaps both. Either way, this is why God is bringing a case against his people to plead and strive against them. They're treating God as if he were a bore, a bother, a burden. That's the idea here. And God says, how is it that you have gotten to the point to where instead of a loving relationship, I'm a bore to you, I'm a bother to you, and you don't really wanna be burdened with me anymore, you're tired of me, you've moved on to other things in life. How could God's people get there? Well, we'll see, by not remembering and giving thanks. That's where it starts. That's where apostasy starts, and that's where faithfulness starts. Are you remembering and giving thanks for grace or not? Let's look then at the second section of our text, verses four and five, what God has done for his people. God says, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. What is that? Well, every Israelite hearing this would know, oh, I've heard that before. In fact, I've heard it all my life. That's exactly the way God introduces the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 2. Hear, Israel, I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, who redeemed you from the house of bondage. Therefore, now that I've saved you by my grace, now that I have redeemed you, here's how you can live in response to that. Don't have other gods besides me. Don't take my name in vain. Honor my Sabbath day. Honor your parents. Don't kill and cheat and lie and steal. The, the law is given in the context of God's redeeming grace. Now, think about this for a moment. God doesn't come to his people with his indictment and say, I've got a problem against you. And they say, okay, why is God mad at us? I gave you 619 laws and you've only kept 583 of them. What's your problem? You can't perfectly keep all these great rules I gave you? You don't like them or something? You're not good enough? What's your issue? That's not what God is doing when he pleads with his people. He goes right to the heart of it. And he says, I'm the God who redeemed you when you didn't deserve it and you didn't earn it. I just called you out of Egypt. I saved you. Why are you bored with me? Why am I a burden and a bother to you now? Have you no sense of gratitude? God's indictment is not because his people can't perfectly keep all the little rules he gave them, it's because they aren't grateful for what he's done for them. That is what prom provokes God to come down and plead and strive to grapple with his own people. Um, interestingly, verse four doesn't stop with a little period after the word slavery, does it? Micah quotes the preamble to the 10 commandments. He says, God has graciously redeemed you, so what's your problem? But then he says, and God says, if that were not enough, I also gave you sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. We think, okay, those are three Bible characters. That's neat. What's the history lesson there, God? Why does God bring these people up? Because God didn't just bring his people out from bondage to sin and then say, now you're on your own. Figure it out. Live how you want to. Just be sure to thank me for what I've done for you. Okay, bye. God brings his people out, and then he gives them another gift, another grace poured out upon them. He says, I'm going to give you leaders, I'm going to give you examples, so that you will know how to serve and follow me. Moses was the mouthpiece of the Lord to bring the word of the Lord to the people of God. Moses set up their worship system, their civil justice system. Aaron was given as a gift to the people of God to atone for their sins year in and year out to be the direct mediator that went into the Holy of Holies to atone. Uh, Miriam was given as an example to lead all of the women in what it looks like to praise the Lord when he's delivered us from our enemies and drowned them in the Red Sea. God gives his people the gift, not only of salvation, but also of leaders and examples among the flock to show and to lead and guide us in what it means to serve him. God has done all of this. Ephesians 4 reminds us that God still gives these same gifts to his church. God gives pastors and teachers to his church, according to Paul, so that we will know what it 
means to grow up into the image of Jesus Christ and so that we will be equipped to do that. You need to remember that God has given to each of you, Pastor Crawl, Mr. Vermont, Pastor Neil, who's also one of our elders up in Fort Worth, he has given these men specifically to you so that you will be able to better serve Jesus, so that you will be able to better know what it means to be a servant of the Lord and what God wants from you and how you can follow him. Don't ignore these gifts of God like Israel did. Pay attention, give thanks, receive and give thanks for these gifts from God to you. As Pastor Richardson reminded us last week, Look around for the, the Moses, the Aaron, the Miriam in this congregation that you say, I need to imitate that. That's God's gift to me. An older, wiser, mature, godly Christian, man or woman that you can look up to and say, I need to be like that. These are all God's gifts to his people. And yet God's people had forgotten and they weren't grateful and they were simply burdened with the worship and the service of the Lord. It was a bother to them. They were weary of it. They were tired of God. Verse 5, oh my people, remember. That's what God is trying to get his people to do. What does repentance looks like, look like? Well, it starts with remember. Remember what God has done for you. Remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised. What Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Well, what happened from Shittim to Gilgal? What's this story of Balaam about? <clears throat> we don't have time to rehearse the whole story of Balaam, but it's a fun one. If you haven't read it before, you should go and read it, read it to your kids, and, uh, and laugh about it at the funny parts. Um, but what God did was he brought his people to the brink of entering into the promised land, and they were encamped at a place near Shittim. Gilgal was also close by. So this is what is happening here. The stage is set. Balaam is living off in a foreign land, Balak, the king of Moab, is living next door to where Israel is coming in and invading, and he's scared to death. And he's a very rich king. And he knows that the most powerful way to defeat your enemies if you're a pagan king is to call some guy who has a really good history of cursing people really effectively and get them to curse your enemies. Balaam actually had this sort of power mysteriously. We don't know how it all worked in the Old Testament, but Balaam was a guy who, if he blessed you, you were blessed. And if he cursed you, you were cursed most of the time. So Balak says, I'm going to hire this foreigner, bring him in, and I'm going to, how can I convince him to come? I'll pay him lots of money. In fact, I will offer him so much riches and honor that he's never seen before, and this plan should have worked. Why? Because we know from the New Testament, Peter says, here's, here's the problem with Balaam's character. He was a greedy man. He was covetous. So what better way to convince him to travel all the way over here and curse your enemies than to offer him more money than he's ever seen in his life? It should have worked. By all human accounts, from a human perspective, this plan should have worked. Balaam should have come, he should have received the money, cursed Israel, and Israel would have been cursed. Balak's plan was perfect, except for one thing. God likes to take impossible situations and work miracles to take a curse and turn it into a blessing. He does this all throughout the Old Testament for his people. This is one of many examples that Micah could have used and he picks this one. Of course, the supreme example of this is the cross itself. When God takes the most horrific, wicked act in all of human history, murdering the only innocent man who's ever lived, and turns it into the most uh, blessed, life-giving act in all of history, the salvation of the world. This is what God likes to do. He did it for his people uh, around this area of Shittim to Gilgal, but of course, as the Israelites are hearing this reference here to Balaam and Balak, and then as soon as Micah says, remember what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, they're going to go, oh wait, there was something else too. There was something else. After Balaam, fast forward another generation or so, and we get, once again, Israel is encamped in Shittim, and they have a new leader now. It's not Moses. It's this man named Yeshua. And Yeshua is about to take the people into God's promised land. Moses didn't take them there, but Yeshua is about to do it. But they have a barrier in their way, and there's no way they can get over that barrier. So God, using Yeshua, works a miracle to divide the barrier that separates them from the presence of God's holy rest, and Yeshua brings the people in from Shittim. And where do they camp once they're in? Gilgal. The movement from Shittim to Gilgal 
is a movement from outside the promised land through Yeshua into the promised land. That's what God did from Shittim to Gilgal. This is a picture of the gospel yet again. These messianic references are everywhere. God, through Micah, is reminding his people, here's how I save you over and over again. I give you all these pictures of the gospel, and yet, I'm a bother to you? You're tired of me? God is calling his people to remember what he has done for them in grace. We see this pattern. We see this pattern play out in our own lives with people that we know, and we see it play out all through the scripture. How does apostasy happen? Well, it starts with not remembering what God has done for you. Not really being thankful for it, just taking it for granted. And then eventually you start to lose your love, your sense of loyalty for Yahweh. And then God's people go and they start making compromises and they start engaging in these sins over here. They're still professing to worship Yahweh. They still got the temple. They still got the worship. I still go to church. I still pray sometimes. But their heart's not in it because they're not grateful. They're just doing it. And then finally, they wake up one morning and they go, you know what? I just don't really care about this, do I? I'm going to engage in more blatant rebellion against God. And before you know it, they wind up in rank idolatry, sin, rebellion against God, and they say, These, this way of serving God is so burdensome to me, I'm just going to be through with it. It's not for me anymore. I'm moving on. And then they don't even look like Yahweh's people anymore. They just look like straight pagans. And the scariest part of it is, they don't care. And you look at people like that, and you wonder, how did you get there? Well, it starts with a failure to remember the grace of God and what he has done in pouring out his redemption, his salvation, and giving thanks for it. If you don't start there, you're not going to have covenant faithfulness with the Lord. Your heart is going to fall away. If you do start there, as God is calling his people to start in Micah, guess what? The rest of it is going to take care of itself, as we see. What God expects from his people, it all flows out of gratitude. It all flows out of remembering God's grace. So, is the worship of God a burden to you? Is it a bother to have to come to church every Sunday? Dads, is it a bother to you to have to make time to read the Bible to your kids? Moms, is it burdensome to you to teach your kids to pray? Kids, are you bored with the things of God? That's how it starts. That's how Israel ended up where they are. They were weary of the Lord. They were tired of having to do all this God stuff. Well, here's the answer. It's to remember and to give thanks. Let's look at what God expects from his people now in verses 6 through 8. Micah's brought his readers to the point, hopefully, of realizing God is angry with us. He's come to plead against us. He's calling the mountains to witness. This is serious stuff. And what's our problem? Oh, he realizes that we're tired of him. We're wearied of him. Well, I guess we're guilty as charged. Okay, then Micah, uh, how did all this happen? Where did this start? What do we do? Well, you should remember and give thanks for what God has already done for you. Okay, yep, we forgot. We should do that. We should remember and give thanks for what God has done. Now, God is still mad at us, so how do we make God happy with us? Maybe we should come before him and bow down and come with all these burnt offerings and calves of a year old. Maybe we should bring a thousand sacrifices. Maybe we should try 10,000 rivers of oil. Maybe what God really wants is our firstborn. Maybe that'll please him. Maybe we should give the fruit of our own body to atone for the sin of our soul before Yahweh. Will that satisfy God, Micah? No, that's not what God wants from you. Well, then what does he want? We'll get to that in a moment. But Micah makes very clear that trying to bring God something of ourselves to atone for the sins of our soul is not going to work. And the good part of it is God doesn't even want us to try anyway. That is not the reaction that he wants from his people. Micah is cutting that one off. 
The reaction here is not, we better offer more sacrifices so God will stop pleading against us so we can go back to life as normal. Nope. Now, interestingly, there's buried in here yet another glimpse of the gospel. Cain and Abel knew from the beginning that they had to approach the presence of the Lord with something. You can't come before God empty-handed. So what did we learn very quickly? Is God going to be pleased with the fruit of the ground? Nope. Why? That can't atone for sin. Well, if the ground is cursed, then the fruit of the ground is also cursed. God's not going to accept the fruit of the ground as a substitute for sin. Okay, well, maybe animals then. So we know throughout the Old Covenant, as Hebrews explains, two things that God was teaching his people. Number one, without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement for sin. And number two, the blood of animals isn't going to cut it, ultimately, because they had to keep doing it over and over and over and over again, because it just wouldn't stick. God was teaching his people, there has to be a blood sacrifice, but wait until I provide the once for all blood sacrifice that will fully and finally atone for your sins. Until I do, do this. Practice this, put it before your eyes, yearn for this, and wait for me to give the perfect sacrifice that'll take away sin. But then Micah goes on, maybe what God really wants is a firstborn. Maybe what God really wants to atone for the sins of our soul is the fruit of a human body. Yes, but not yours, right? If the fruit of the ground is unacceptable because it comes from a cursed ground, guess what? The fruit of your body, the firstborn that comes from you, is also going to be unacceptable before God because it bears the same curse and corruption that you bear. Does God want a firstborn? Yes. Is yours going to do any good? Nope. Does God require the fruit of a body for the sins of the souls of his people? Yes. Can you come up with one to bring to God? Nope. So then who's going to atone for our sins? God says, this is my promise all along. You don't need to worry about that. I will give my firstborn. I will give my only begotten son. I will give the fruit of the virgin's body to atone for the sins of my people. But that's not what I require of you. Okay, well then what do you require of us, God? Well, I'm glad you asked, Micah says. Verse 8, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Remember what God has done to pour out his grace and redeem you from the house of bondage, from slavery to sin and corruption, to set you in his promised land, moving you from Shittim to Gilgal through Yeshua. Remember that God himself is the one who will atone for your sins. You don't need to try to do that before him. Instead, what does God want? If he's already poured out his grace upon me, if he's already atoned for my sin, then what am I supposed to do with the rest of my life? Well, it is from this position of having received the redemption and the grace of God that God says, okay, now we can talk about it if you really want to talk. If you are going to remember my grace and give thanks for it, then here's what you can do to live as I want you to live. I want you to do justice. I want you to love kindness. I want you to walk humbly with me. So very briefly, what does that mean? Some people, I think, have a, a misconception. They read Micah 6, 8, and a lot of translations say, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And they think, oh, well, God wants us to follow all the rules, be patient with people who don't, and then um, just you know, be humble and make sure that we're good with him. That's not really what's going on here. But it's a very superficial reading of the text. So let's look at this. What is justice? It's the Hebrew word mishpat. It is first used in Genesis 18, where God says, here's why I chose Abraham. I knew Abraham. He's going to command his household after him, and Abraham and his descendants are going to walk in faithfulness to what I reveal to him. He's going to do the mishpat of Yahweh. Abraham is going to do the justice of the Lord that God has said, I'm going to reveal this to Abraham and I know he's going to walk in my ways. Throughout the Old Testament, it's this sense of doing what God has already revealed to you. It's walking in the ways of the Lord instead of the desires of your own heart. That's what God wants. He wants us to live according to his revealed wisdom instead of living according to the desires and the imaginations of our own heart. Does this apply in the new covenant? Yes. How do we know? 
Well, Ezekiel tells us, in Ezekiel 36, he uses the same word, mishpat, and he says, God is going to bring a new covenant. He's going to establish a new covenant. He's going to pour out his spirit, and he's going to make everyone alive and empowered by the presence of his spirit in this new covenant when he forgives and atones for all their sins. And then everybody is going to be able to walk in the mishpat of the Lord. What does God want from you? Well, stop doing it your way and listen to the Bible and walk that way. What about kindness? It's the word chesed. God's chesed, love, mercy, grace, kindness, compassion for his people. Many of you have probably heard this word. Um, it's used hundreds of times in the Old Testament, over a hundred times in Psalms alone. It's the common refrain through the Old Testament, for his mercy endures forever, for his mercy endures forever. If that sounds familiar to you, it's because we say it here every Sunday. Give thanks to the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. What is the idea of kindness? Is it just being nice to people? I mean, God is nice to us, so we should be nice to others. No. What is in view with chesed is passing over the transgressions, not giving you what you deserve, but instead treating you with a mercy and a kindness because God has forgiven your sins and he has washed over all of your iniquities. How do we know this? Well, the only other use of chesed in the book of Micah is at the very end of Micah. If, you, if you've got your Bible open to Micah 6, flip over to Micah 7. Verses 18 through 20, God ends the prophecy of Micah with this promise for his people. God will pass over the sins of his people because he delights in chesed. God forgives out of chesed. He casts all our sins into the depths of the sea. He shows chesed. So what is it for us to love kindness? It's not just to be a nice person and be polite. It's specifically to pass over the transgressions of those who sin against you, just as God in Christ has passed over your transgressions. Paul reminds the Ephesians church, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's what Mike is getting at here. Jesus says even more bluntly in Matthew 18, if you do not from your heart forgive your brother his trespasses, my heavenly Father will not forgive you. That's what Mike is talking about here. If you remember and give thanks for what God has done for you, you better extend that same forgiveness to others. But they don't deserve it. Neither did you. Don't you remember? What about walking humbly with God? This word for walk, yalak, is used to describe a lifestyle, a pattern, an orientation in life. What are you doing with your life? Where are you aiming? Where are you directed? Where are you going towards and how are you conducting yourself as you go there? That's what it means to walk in the Old Testament. As we walk through life, are we doing it pretending to do it on our own? Or are we walking self-consciously in humble submission to the Lord as we go through. That's what the word humbly means, has the idea of submission. Are we walking on our own, or are we walking in submission with the Lord to his ways? So what does God want from us? He wants what he has wanted from his people all along. He brings an indictment against his people. He pleads and grapples with his people because they are tired of him. They're weary. They can't be bothered anymore. They just don't care. They have forgotten what he has done for them by his grace to redeem them. He's already taken care of their sin problem. They don't need to worry about trying to atone for their sins. That's not what he wants from them. He's already done that. He's already promised to do it for Micah's audience, and he's done it for us here today in Christ. So then what does God want? He wants us to remember. He wants us to be grateful and out of that gratitude, as a recipient of grace, flows a life that says, Lord, I want to know what you think about this, and I want to do that. Lord, I want to forgive other people the same way you've forgiven me. And Lord, I don't want to pretend to live my life for myself by myself. I want to walk with you through this life. That's what God wants. This is the way of keeping covenant with God. This is what covenant faithfulness looks like, and it all starts with remember and give thanks. We are so prone to forget. If only we could have a built-in, regular, routine, 
reminder. A reminder of what God has done for us in Christ. A reminder that forces us to see once again and consider that God has sent His firstborn, the fruit of the body of the virgin's womb, to atone for the sins of our souls. That God has brought us from Shittim to Gilgal in Christ. That God's only begotten Son came and gave His flesh to be the life of the world. That He shed His own blood to atone for the sins of His people. If only there were some regular reminder that was built into our routine that would force us to remember and give thanks for what God has done for us in Christ. Here it is. It's right here. This is where we remember and proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus every time we do this, every time we gather together, until he comes again. This is the table of Eucharist. That's what Christians have called this table for centuries after centuries. What does Eucharist mean? It means thanksgiving. We know that we come here to do what? To remember and to give thanks. And out of that flows all of the other covenant faithfulness that God requires of us. Are you sitting there thinking to yourself this morning, I'm pretty sure I'm doing things my way. I don't know where I'm going to get the strength to be able to listen to what God says and do that. Well, come to this table this morning. Remember what Christ has done for you and give thanks because that's where it starts. Are you thinking, how am I going to be able to forgive that person? Maybe I can be nice to them when I see them, but I don't know how to really actually forgive them from the heart. Come to this table. Remember what it took for God to forgive your sins. Give thanks and then forgive your brother. Do you feel distant from God as if you're walking through life and God's at arm's length and you're just kind of walking on your, walking on your own, doing your own thing? Then come and remember give thanks, and take the communion that God offers you with himself here at this table and carry that with you as you walk through the rest of your life. This is what God has given us to keep covenant with him. And it all starts with remember and give thanks. Father, we remember what you have done for us through your son. We remember that you sent your only begotten son into the world, taking on human flesh and as an offering for sin, condemning the sin that has afflicted and oppressed our own flesh. You have given your firstborn to atone for the sins of our souls. We remember and we give thanks. Teach us to walk with you in gratitude every day of our life, that we would never treat you as a burden or a bother, but as the joy and delight of our soul. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.